Next uh, department on the agenda is the fire department with Chief Barron and that can be found on page 32 33. Good morning, Chief. personnel that you have 
or do you foresee that we still could add more and you'd be more comfortable with the current situation? Well, I think we've uh, addressed... And we can't give you more, so it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like it's, a, it's, a, it's an answer that has any true effect, but it helps us know for future budgets, for this budget. I mean, sure. Um, well, the, you know, the budget progress process uh, is a bit of give and take. And uh, this, this is... Police uh, department gives, you take, according to Chief Keenan. Mm -hmm. Some years, my department gives, police department takes. Well, this appears to be our year. Yes, right. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, um, moving forward, um, we're, we're certainly, for emergency response, uh, we're, we're in very, very good shape. Uh, I, um, future challenges, uh, I, I'd like to address some of our uh, IT issues, uh, and, um, and, and I could use a couple more staff positions. But, uh, certainly, we're, we're uh, keeping up with all the demands, and, and uh, we're in a good place. And so, uh, touching upon the staff demands, um, how is the, um, I believe in last year's budget, uh, one of the big uh, ticket items for one of the, the, the more notable pieces of your budget was the addition of a financial officer in the department, right? How has that been working out? Uh, it, it, can you just rephrase the question? Sure. Can, last year, we had a financial position to the department that didn't previously exist to help with uh, budget management, overtime management, things of that nature. Uh, for, for the additional staff? Yeah, last year. In last year's budget, we added that. I yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, How has that been working out? Chris, Chris Fallen is with us today. He is on top of things. He anticipates uh, some of the issue. He <laughs> communicates um, terrifically with municipal finance. Uh, so it, it's been a great improvement, and, and it's been a burden to leave. And where are we in terms of um, overtime planning? I know that obviously that's a piece of this budget too. But how do you feel in terms of where we're at with that? For the, for the with overtime, yeah. Yeah. overtime expenditure, we're going to be seeing a, um, a year-end uh, well, expense that we're going to have to pay at the end of the fiscal year, or even halfway through the fiscal year. Well, we're, we're <coughs> we, may need to, we will need to make an adjustment at the end of the year. Uh, prior years, as I'm sure you're aware, the rescue truck went in service in the difficult winter months. And sometimes, and for most of the time, it was only evenings. Uh, this year, uh, working with the mayor, uh, there was agreement and uh, in keeping the rescue truck in service full time. And, and that did uh, create a overtime burden. Uh, we had hoped to get the new hires uh, on the truck sooner. We started the process of hiring in, um, this time last year. And in going through that process, it was identified that we would have more vacancies in the coming year. And so we tried to anticipate them, uh, get these firefighters in, the, in a training program in a recruit drill school. Uh, it is difficult to identify uh, play, uh, outside of the city where we can get these numbers trained. We often use the city of Boston, uh, their drill school, and they're very generous uh, with the slots that they have. Uh, we also use the state drill school. And, um, they won't take the types of numbers that we were looking to put through. So a lot of the burden on overtime is not having those uh, bodies on the trucks and, and taking, uh, a, putting together a cadre of instructors. We had to take some of those people uh, off of the suppression force uh, to, to uh, effectively run a recruit school that would compare to the state school. And so we can provide the best amount of training for these 26 new recruits that we hired. So that did create a burden on this year's budget. This year's budget meaning 2000, the, the budget we're in, or the previous budget we just created in July? Oh, the budget we're in. Oh, the one, so the one that will end. <coughs> the one that ends in two months. Sorry? The budget that ends in two months. That's correct. I, I thought that was your question. It, it could have been. Um, uh, Sometimes I don't even know, Chief. Um, so, so you anticipate we're going to have to close a gap 
within the next couple of months, but that the, the budget you've requested here of 2.1 million for overtime will prevent that next year from there being a gap. Uh, that's correct. Okay. All right. And we got to the answer. Um, so, um, just a couple other quick questions. Uh, the hazardous duty pay. What is what is that? Can you explain what that? What's the hazardous duty line? Well, kind of something that everything we do is hazardous. That's not, right. That's, uh, that's a budget line that is contractual with the unit. Okay. So what is it? It's just a, um, like a, a sprinkle in to the into the salaries in terms of a almost like not like a bonus, but it's that's correct. It's, okay. it's a, a budget line that is irrespective of rank. Okay. And so the reason why it went up. Um, is based on the contract. Uh, the contract and additional 16 positions. Got it. Same with the shift differential? Uh, that's correct. That's okay. And what is the shift di differential? Uh, per person? No, not the amount. What does it mean? What's the shift? Well, it, it, it's for nights and weekends. That's okay. what's con contracted uh, in excess of probably excess of 20 years ago. Okay. And then it contractually goes up based on the percentages. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we're about to embark on um, some construction in the downtown um, that we've never had such high buildings in the city of Quincy. And I'm just curious if you can speak to um, our preparedness now or how we will be prepared uh, to deal with incidents that you guys deal with on a daily basis, but in a, in a large, tall building like is, is being planned for the downtown? Well, um, we work through the inspection services to make sure that the protection within the building uh, is, um, is up to code. A uh, fully sprinkled building is designed to hold the fire in check, uh, typically not extinguish it entirely. Uh, when you get a building over seven stories, uh, which we have many of in the city already, you're, you're above the reach of our ladders. So it becomes an interior firefighting uh, operation. And uh, we're prepared to do that. So is, uh, and is that typical? You have seven stories, is, is that the extent of a ladder's reach in the, in the industry? You know, in the well, there are some that are designed larger, uh, but um, typically, uh, the buildings that we're talking about in Quincy, we treat as a window, but windowless building, similar to something that's even below grade. Uh, so um, the, the, the real challenge to that type of a building is the reflex time from the time you get to the curb to the time you get up to a fire alarm. It gives it time to grow uh, a little bit. But, you know, we, we rely on the designs, and, and we know they're not always perfect. But, um, that's what you find in all of our larger cities, and that's what Quincy has become. Right, and I guess that's why I'm asking, because we've, we've never had an in-store building in the city of Quincy. Our fire department has never had to address emergency calls on the 15th floor before in the city of Quincy. And um, you know, I, in the back of my head, it's a concern that I have, is we're a city that's growing, and we've set this cap of 15 stories in the downtown, and we don't know what else is going to be developed on, on way um, and the rest of the Hancock plot and it could be buildings uh, that come out that are 15 story buildings um, so it's important to me that when we're voting on some of this stuff up here knowing that the fire department has the resources to do whatever they need to do to make sure that folks in those buildings are safe as well as folks in our fire department are safe in responding to emergencies at, at that level I mean I don't know I'm a lawyer I don't know what it takes what the difference it takes in fire rescue uh, or, 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 or fighting a fire between 4-7 and 4-15. I don't know. I rely upon you, but I would hope that you would tell us if you need something more um, that, or there's something else that we can do as a council to ensure um, safety, whether that's in terms of an ordinance um, regarding construction or, um, you know, I know I, I know when I'm in Boston, I think I see this, this is like brass plates <clears throat> on buildings that seem to have something to do with with firefighting information on it. Um, but if there's anything that you or members of your department think 
could assist as we move into a, a city that has taller buildings than what we typically had in the past. Do you think there's anything that, that we can do by way of ordinance, by way of regulation, to improve safety for buildings <coughs> over a certain height? I would certainly <coughs> welcome that and, and help you in any way that I could on the, on the council, I'm sure my colleagues would as well, to ensure that that, that <coughs> of safety is, is done for, for both residents and for our firefighters. Thank you, Chief. Keep up the good work. Also. Thank you. Um, Chief, a couple comments and then maybe a question or two. But uh, brevity. So, you know, when I first came in, one of the is a you know my, my role now is uh, you know work to city council. One of the uh, the, the biggest eye-opening educational opportunities that I had was I was fortunate enough. Well, you know, I, I didn't know it at the time, but to go out and um, participate in Stone Cabin. Uh, it was still, right? The fire academy? That's correct. Right. right. So they take the day and they literally run you through drills. And at the time, I was in much better shape than I was now. Um, and I can tell you that I was probably sore for about three days and, you know, smelled like smoke, um, as my wife graciously pointed out. But my point in all that was, you know, it was literally, you know, a three, four, five hour uh, crash course to an extent uh, in the day in the life of a, uh, of a firefighter. You know, that that um, that experience it always just stayed at the forefront of my head, particularly now at budget time. Because you know, and I live right there, engine one, right? So I see the the, uh, the apparatus coming in and out of the station, and um, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of know, okay, well, they must be going to an emergency situation, but you know, having had that experience, and again, it was very minimal. We're dealing with straw fires, right? You guys are dealing with fill in the blank. But I say that because it, it was truly you know, one of the most eye-opening experiences that I had here, uh, up at the city council. And kind of coinciding with that, along with many of my colleagues sitting here today, that we all um, have been advocates and very vocal, particularly around budget time, of the uh, you know, the importance of the rescue truck uh, being live within your fleet. And, you know, uh, I know we took a vote. I think it was last year to, uh, to put that in full time on you know, the recommendation of the mayor. And that's just such a critical piece of equipment, um, as I think we'd all agree. And just how that affects me and my district, um, as you know, you know I represent uh, five senior buildings. So 1,000 Southern Ottery, Pegnano Towers, Marcus Street, 25 and 45 School Street. And you know, response time in those particular areas when you're dealing with senior citizens is is absolutely critical. So knowing that you know you have advocated and the men, some of who are with us here today, have advocated you know to increase the staffing level, which is imperative. Um, you know I look at this as so now you have the staffing level. You know you got to give folks, you know firefighters, the, uh, the tools and the opportunities to be successful because that is a very very dangerous job. And again, um, what I saw at my Little field trip to the still fire academy was, you know, at the base level and stuff that you guys are dealing with on a daily basis was uh, quite tremendous. You know, I had a series of questions and I'm not going to recycle them because Council Talmudji touched on them. But as we consider uh, the build out of our city, you mentioned the fire suppression system, and you know, I'm sure that uh, you know, by code everyone was mandated to, to have uh, you know fire suppression system. But I guess what I'm what I'm interested in are there different calibers of fire suppression system or is everything just sort of builder's grade and it's all you know standard issue and i'll tell you why i'm asking that question uh, there is a full uh, nfpa standard on, on on fire suppression systems and and they um, there are lesser systems but, but they're for one and two family dwellings and um, certain commercial occupancies but um, the buildings that we're talking about are fully sprinkled. And right. So that's a full NFPA 13 sprinkler. And that's the Cadillac standard. That's, that's what I'm trying to figure that's out. That's the Cadillac standard of fire suppression sprinklers. There, there, are, there are some deviations for sensitive electronic equipment. But by and large, it's a, it's a full system. And those, uh, those are the separate systems uh, that are for um, electronic sensitive electronic equipment 
Um, the um, people working in those areas have to vacate before the system, uh, uh, system activates. So they, they have a pre order to tell people to get out. But they're very limited. We only have um, State Street, uh, I believe, has one. We don't really have many of them. So there's not necessarily an opportunity from your side of the table to, to advocate for um, you know, the, the, the top of the line fire suppression system. It's kind of a standard issue as it relates to the code. And all buildings kind of wear the same sprinkler system. Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I, again, I concur with my fellow colleague here. I think that does become, you know, um, you know anything that we can do to kind of put folks that serve in the best position possible to, to be successful because those, uh, those those situations can get very very hairy and you know, I, I kind of read about it after they happen and it's just like wow you know so it takes a special kind of person to, to actually you know put on the equipment and do that so um, I'm grateful for you know what they do for the city and in particular you know the people that I represent in uh, in Ward Two so um, appreciate you coming here. And, Further questions for Chief Barron and Councilman Bonham? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Thank you for coming by. We're going to miss you, by the way. So I'm going to first miss you. Thank you, Council. I anticipate being here for a while. Okay, good. Okay. Cool. Thank you for passing this handout over. I mean, the data that you got out of, that I got out of this is types of instance, instance by stations, runs by ASMRAS. This is all the, the official data. How do, how do you compute this? Is the call comes in and it goes and gets computed. Who does this type of um, service? Uh, well, each officer responding to an incident uh, files a report is computer generated. And then the fire prevention officer uh, has, uh, compiles these forms for, for budget. Uh, so I have two firefighters up there, the Rex uh, firefighter uh, Jimmy Warren and Firefighter Michael Slade. This, this, is, this is great. This is great information. It gives me the data breakdown for each department, each situation. I, I thank you for passing this on. It gives me a better understanding of everything. I just want to get into a little bit about the overlapping of departments. And what I mean by that is I'm looking at over 2016, there were 770, 779 hazardous incidents including like the you know, Apollo lines that went down. This past year, um, Paul Franz came in from the park department and I've been doing a lot of work with him with, with different trees and branch repairs. And just outside my house to the right of me, we, over the last three years, we had had two times where you guys had to come out and the branches and the, there was big branches that came down. So you guys had to come out twice. But just recently he came out and he did the maintenance of it just takes branches down. Are you seeing a difference in stuff like that that is helping around the city? That you're getting an overlap of trees being trimmed or trees, be, trees being taken down for dead that are helping you with your workforce? Well, that certainly is a big help. Well, every time we get an ice storm or a hurricane, uh, our Almost go, go up dramatically. So certainly uh, that maintenance uh, is a huge. Yeah, because I, I feel that in something against the last group, we had a list that was very long, and what happened was we started to study over on the list and they started to get prepared <coughs> done as the call for coming in. But just the experience that I was having, you could come out twice in the last two years, and then now it's been done in this past winter, there was zero problems with the tree. It was just like nothing fell off of it. So they, they did a great job. And I remember just calling in and each time we get a big, a big storm, like you said, and then something big would come down. Um, it's quite a big tree. But I, I, looking at this, do you, um, like Council Kamuchi, Council Crow had said, you think since 2003, are you at that mark of amount of workforce now? Or are you still below the marker of how many um, men that have been on the on your unit, the whole so, department. Council, we, we, we would always, any fire chief would love all personnel. Uh, 
this, this uh, response plan for this area <coughs> is challenging due to the geography. We've got you know, the train traps that basically split the city, but we've got three peninsulas. Uh, we try to keep our response times within three minutes of the of the city. Uh, and um, so we do have um, stations that are dramatically busier than others, and apparatus that are dramatically busier than the others. Uh, Deputy Chief Joe Jackson is here today. Uh, he's been working with an IT specialist, and, and we're setting the goal for the coming year to try to even out some of that money, but it's very limited as to what we can do, uh, again, based on our uh, uh, um, So um, it does require more stations and, and uh, apparatus uh, for the fire plans only. I'd love to say that uh, I run a minimum remaining right now of three men on each piece of apparatus. It's typically an officer with two firefighters. Uh, assigned uh, with this new budget, we're one in three on each apparatus. Uh, that will allow, um, depending on vacations uh, or, and, and you know, illness, uh, will allow more firefighters on the trucks. You have the numbers from 2003 of what you had for workforce? compared to right now? We, we had 218. 218, what are we at right now with the, the same that 26 come on board? Uh, and and when, are they, when are they graduating, the next week, or do they graduate yet? Uh, they'll be on the trucks Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend, okay. They have a graduation, okay. which uh, invitations to go out for the city council. I did, I did, I did. And that's next Thursday. They will come back for uh, some specific uh, uh, training, training for health. And again, that's something else that uh, Deputy Chief Jackson has worked on with the mayor's office and the union. Uh, but they will be on the trucks for more than three. And you said 218 from 2003. What would it be now? Or what is it today? And what would it be? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be at, um, in, in this budget, year 217. Yes. How many? How many? Do you, you said 218. Men from 2003. 2003. What are you, what's the numbers at right now? I, I believe we're at 217. We're at 217. Okay. We're going to carry forward into the coming, into the coming budget year with this budget. <coughs> okay. Just just to elaborate for the public, we're a growing city. We've grown since 2003, and we're just at the marker of where we we're at back then. So, moving forward, I'd, I'd obviously like to see more. We, we have balanced it off, like Council Cummings, you said, one year inspired, thanks, yes, please. It's trying to balance between the two stations. Um, but thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for all the men that have come in today. It's all work the fire department. Appreciate all everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Hughes. Yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Hughes, Council Cummings, uh, just want to thank uh, Chief Barron and um, his team for the excellent work they uh, do here and the service they provide to the city. So thank you very much. Um, and with that, as the only board counselor who has no firehouse <laughs> in her award, I'm like the only one, um, I'd like to approve. Thank you, Council. Motion to uh, approve on the motion. Council of Forest. Thank you. I was. I didn't know if Council was ahead of me in the lineup. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the chief. Chief, uh, one, obviously, this fiscal year we've had a really difficult fire down in House Act Ward 1, and I just want to commend you and the department for your responsiveness and your helpfulness to the family. Uh, they've been, I know, they've been special appreciation to you and to me, and um, that was very tough, tough for our community. I know you provided with us the 2016 statistics and the year end, and it's interesting, 774 fires in the calendar year. You know, we're responding to 100 fires a week. I don't think people realize the volume. You know, because of so much of us recognize a lot of the runs are medical calls and you know automobile accidents, yet actual fires in the city, um, the number that's, that's occurring. I was impressed about the minimum, the minimal, you know, the on an average is straight up by numbers, 1875 for the dollar average of the loss. So what we're finding is a lot of fires happening, there's clearly a quick response, and there's minimal damage. And I think that's uh, a particular statistic that I saw that I wanted to make note of. The other comment I had is you had referenced some IT issues as challenges going forward, and I'm curious, 
Is that something that you manage internally within your department, or is that something that you rely upon the city's IT department to manage for you? How is that handled? To manage? The IT. In well, we, we rely on the city um, to, to manage the existing uh, structure that we have. Uh, Everything from radio, all of your technology, the city's managing. The city IT department. The, the city IT department, that, yeah. that's correct. We, we do uh, get some, uh, well, it, the city's IT department does have uh, personnel within the police station. Okay. And, and Joe Petrovich uh, is helpful to us. Uh, he's very helpful. He's also very busy. So. Chuck Phelan also sends myself and I think a couple of the council tech savvy colleagues to Joe P. So we're very uh, appreciative of his service. <coughs> So he also pitches to your department. That's, that's correct. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um, I think, have you had a conversation um, with the IT director as to, you know, what the advice is and what technology you can acquire to move the department forward and modernize? You know, who's, who's, who's making those type of decisions? It, 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 it's an area that, quite honestly, I've been on this I have been a mess in not addressing it sooner. Uh, we've had so many other challenges that um, I, I really have not been able to move forward in a way that I would like to. Um, the software that we have, it's difficult mining information out of it that's valuable. Uh, and um, we really haven't internally developed that person. Uh, uh, that, so the two gentlemen in fire prevention that I mentioned do an excellent job, but um, I, I, really the challenge is to try to, you, you can see headquarters apparatus, certain apparatus is much busier than others. So in the grand scheme, when we talk about a new public safety headquarters, in anticipation of that, um, I have asked Deputy Chief Jackson to sort of uh, work on some forms of redeployment that um, that we can do now, but then in anticipation of, of gaining that capability when we start to look at a new location. So it, it's a challenge to come in here to try to work with the software we have, identify um, the uh, discrepancies, and then try to come forward. Uh, next year with a plan that, that is more usable and uh, user-friendly for us to uh, to address some of these issues. So, I, you know, I appreciate that, Chief. I feel like one of these frustrations is technology and trying to work with outdated business practices and outdated technology as time the city comes to modernize. Every time the IT budget's you know, going to be later on our agenda is one of those, and I'm always saying, we're not spending enough time, let's work smarter, not harder. Let's utilize you know, the modernized modern software and use the tools that are available to us in 2017. So that's something I'm glad it's something you're recognizing and looking to move forward with. And I look forward to uh, any support that I can give on that. My last um, topic, of course, is one I was really grateful to hear that the rescue has been in service. I know that that's something that's been long advocated for. And then there's another apparatus, obviously, that's important to the district that I represent. Um, and then that's the aquatic deployment of uh, the department. So the boat is staged currently at um, Engine 6 out of house deck. And I think we're looking, this boating season is about to get underway. We've got a lot of coastal infrastructure and emergency response. And I didn't know if you had an update on that, what the plan is. I'm sorry, guys, what was the question? So the boat staged at Engine 6, what the plan is for this season? Uh, we've been uh, considering looking for a location to keep it in the water. Mm -hmm. um, is the House and Barrison Center the yes. work space there that would be available to you? We, we, we plan on uh, working with uh, Lieutenant Gillen to try to identify where we can best uh, locate it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have to launch it for moving, which is, as you know, extremely time consuming. And difficult, right? I mean, let's talk about the um, trail navigation, we have some challenges, obviously the boat ramp, the tidal restrictions, the boat needs to stay in the water. We, we did recently from uh, Homeland Security pick up a, uh, a another inflatable with the 
rescue truck in service. Uh, we are going to, uh, it is on the rescue truck right now. Uh, we will play it very quickly. Uh, and uh, we have a, a 30 cost motor that we can put on it. So the plan would be uh, if we needed something in the Defonso River, uh, the Squatter area, we would deploy the rescue truck. Mm -hmm. And cover um, and that, and that would be it. We would be able to launch that faster than moving the boat from engine six. Right. So it, it, it sort of brings up the, um, the possibility of uh, leaving that, uh, that bridge and hollow plate will, it's in house and I can move on. I appreciate that, Chief. I think that's a good plan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council for us, Council Leanne. Thank you. Good morning, Chief. I was just sorry. wanted to say thank you again to the folks over in the North Quincy Engine 2 for inviting us in and really getting to walk through and be more hands on with their equipment and their uniforms. Um, it was really impressive you know, learning about uh, the training program um, and really everything they go through from start to finish when they're responding to a call. Uh, that being said, the uniform allowance here is very minimal, it seems. It's only $750. I mean, we just, for the police department, uh, for the new recruits, you know, we broke it in, I think it was $64,000. And, uh, you know, again, being hands on and being able to see the uniforms up close, it just seems like 750 is such a low number. Again, can't add to the budget. I'm not saying that we should. Can you just explain why the number is so low on this? Because even in fiscal year 17, when we appropriated $750, we didn't spend any of that. Um, so are the uniforms not under this line, or is this for a different type of uniform that I'm just not understanding? I, I had meant to have that figure for the world. Um, that, was, that was negotiated under my salary a number of years ago. Uh, and uh, my salary structure changed as the unions did. The union negotiated uh, had, had the money moved to another line. So where the union did that, I've never touched that one. So it is, um, it, it, it is compensated, but, but not shown as a line I'm, I'm sorry, so the, you said this, this is compensated but not shown by a line item? What do you mean? Um, that, that was uh, about six years ago, during a union negotiation um, for other benefits, the union gave that. But they're still required in the rules and regulations of the department uh, to, con to conform with certain um, uniform guidelines. And those are the station work uniforms and dress uniforms. Um, the city uh, still provides uh, for personal protective equipment. And this line would go towards that, should it be needed? Sorry? Would this line item then go towards towards those uh, sort of other pieces of uniform that would be needed then on the line? So not the main here that the firefighters are wearing, but you're saying other pieces of uh, uniform that they might be would be taken out of this line item if it were needed? Are you referring to the 750 yes. that exists? Mm -hmm. um, I, I should have removed that from the budget, but I didn't. I don't use it and it, it doesn't get spent. Okay. It's my error. No, no, I mean, it's, it, I thought it was low. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about uniforms and equipment for your firefighters, you know, I want to make sure they're well equipped with what they need uh, for the dangerous work they do. So it just seemed odd to me that it was such a low number. Um, it, with all due respect to your department, if that line is not needed, um, and, and you're sure that's not needed for any subsequent equipment or pieces of uniform that they need, and there's, it's not going to be touched. I do make a motion then um, to, to cut this up from the budget. Again, just Chief, if, if you're saying that the item's not going to be used and it shouldn't have been in the budget to begin with, and, uh, it, and you know you're not going to need it for this coming fiscal year, uh, then I'd like to make a motion to remove that. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor to cut $750. Chief, just for point of clarity, you're recommending that that gets cut from the budget? I think that I didn't use it last year. It was part of a contract that I had that goes back a, a number of years when the union negotiated it away uh, for other benefits. I didn't feel like taking it, so I didn't use it. So I don't have a problem with it being taken away. Okay, so that's 
So you just basically say you remove it because I don't use it. Correct. Correct? Okay. That being said, Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll to uh, cut $750 from the Food Up Restaurant Service and not the Bottom line. Yes, correct. Um, for the uniform allowance. The uniform allowance, special service. Council Cain. Yes. Council DeBowman. No. Council Finn. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Barnes. Yes. Council Leanne. Yes. Council Kamuji. Council Chairman Ford. Yes. Council. Yes. What was that? Seven to one. That removes the seven hundred and fifty dollars from the line item for the chiefs. All set, Council? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank there you. is a motion on the floor made by Council Hughes, yes. by Council Hughes to now accept the budget as amended, less the $750. So, um, any further discussion on that one? Seeing none, Madam Clark, you please call the roll. Council King? Yes. Council DeBona? Yes. Council Fenn? Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council of Yes. Council of Yes. Council of Yes. Chairman Cole. Yes. Okay. Eight voting in the affirmative. Uh, Chief Barron, you are up now on emergency management. Constantly you can find that on page 34. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can see the emergency management budget it is largely now changed. The increase reflects. Um, is a uh, motion to move approval? Any discussion on made by Council Hughes? Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council King? Yes. Council Bowman? Yes. Council Finn? Council Harris? Yes. Council Hughes? Yes. Council Barnes? Yes. Council Leanne? Yes. Council Bowman Yes. Chairman Cole? Yes. Eight members voting in the affirmative. Chief Young, thank you for your time, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. Thank you, Joel, 792, for coming here this morning as well. Next item on the agenda, counselors, is traffic, parking, alarm, lighting. Um, we'll hear from Michael Coffey, and that can be found on page 36, 37 of your account. Good morning, Good morning Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Council. Uh, I would like to start by introducing a few members of my department that showed up this morning. Eddie Grant, who's my uh, assistant. Uh, Brent Campbell, who is Superintendent of our electricians and Fred Souza, who I think most know the parking operation. And with that, I'll uh, review some of the changes that were requested for the uh, FI 18 budget. Uh, major changes we were requesting the addition of one junior traffic engineer. Uh, we're also doing some title changes. Among those, is changing the title from a senior traffic engineering aide to a junior traffic engineer, and also adding one junior traffic engineer. With Frank changing the job titles that we, we've had for years, from signal maintainers to electricians, from an assistant superintendent to an electrician as well. We are increasing, are requesting an increase in overtime by $42,000. The primary reason for that increase is uh, emergency response requests that come in. Uh, our electricians and our traffic operations folks are probably out, I'm guessing, five or six nights per week on emergency responses. Uh, it seems to be growing and growing and growing. Uh, we've also introduced, uh, under uh, Brent Campbell's direction, a new innovative program to uh, fix some of the issues with the fire alarm systems in our schools. And also to start replacing some of the school flashing lights. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first one I think we completed it yesterday in Appleton Howe. Uh, you know, and I want to thank Brent Campbell for this. Uh, the mayor asked us to find a better, faster way to do some things, and I think Brent stepped to the table to do that. We, uh, I think the first school we looked at was uh, Lincoln Hancock, and I think we had a quote of twenty-five or thirty-five thousand dollars for a vent to come in outside to do that work. Brent was able to get his team of new electricians together to go out there on a weekend, buy the equipment himself, replace all the equipment. I think it came in at $14,000. We did the same thing at Broad Middle School. We did the same thing at Atlantic Middle School. And I think the end result was saving the taxpayer almost $100,000 this year. So 
So unfortunately, the flip side of that is we are increasing our overtime to do that. To get into the schools in particular, they really have to go on vacation time and what we get to do that work. So we're requesting an increase in overtime at $40,000 for, uh, for this coming year. Uh, also, uh, uh, requesting an increase of uh, wage, salary wage, temp, we want to bring in another temp to the summer to kind of help work through some of the backlog we have on, uh, on making two requests, in particular in the area of signs that are faded, holes that are bent that need to be straightened, signs that need to be replaced, and so forth. Uh, we want to increase police details by $10,000. That's a direct uh, uh, response to the increase in emergency requests we get. Oh, by the way, the increase in emergency requests that we do see, you know, there's lots of people who are traffic lights with the age and the wear and tear on our traffic light systems. Uh, we have, I think, uh, it's either three or four intersections that go down on the same time it rains. Uh, we know why they go down because the conduit in the, in the, in the ground is broken and or the wire is frayed to be no longer the tape. So we go out there and we we'll restart these intersections. We try to splice and tape them up and get them going again. We're not really fixing the problem, we're repairing the problem temporarily. As I said, we're kind of MacGyvering some of these, uh, some of these issues. And you know, the concern I have that's been expressed to me by outside repair people as well as our internal people is the next time we come back to this intersection, we may not be able to get it going. So that's kind of something we worry about a little bit. But, so associated that was an increase in police details. Uh, we did add a new line item here to repair uh, traffic signal loops. These are the loops that you drive over when you approach an intersection that sends a signal to, to the uh, controller that says someone's at this light, can you change the light for me? And I think we started this year with over 20 of them out we repaired them, we kind of cobbled together and transferred around money to do that. We want to increase the crosswalk improvement supplies by about fifteen thousand uh, dollars. That's really in, in a reflection of the, the move to uh, regular oil-based paint to epoxy paint. And epoxy paint, you see, it, it really jumps out at you in the evening when you see when the lights hit it. And you can see it in the crosswalks now and down in some of the skip lines that we just did a few weeks ago. Uh, the reflective capability was really much much better than oil-based. And by the way, it lasts about five times longer than the oil-based paint. So uh, within another year or two, we will have converted most of our white painting to uh, epoxy-based painting. And that should give you a better, better handle on maintenance costs going further. Rather than painting, you know, uh, with oil-based paint, you have to paint every crosswalk every single year. With the epoxy paint, it's every four to five years. So we, I think we're pushing in the right direction for that. Uh, vehicular supplies, I think we already spent over $20,000 this year on vehicular supplies that we had to to accommodate transfers and movements from other of our budgets. Uh, I think that will go down next year uh, a little bit, but I can still pay the $15,000 on uh, And public work supplies, the $9,000 increase is reflected in the budget. And I think that that is all of the changes we have that we're requesting. Council King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you see Ms. Crawford and Mike Carr? Good, thank you. Good. Um, you said a lot uh, in the things that you are changing to the budget. I'm, I'm very much interested in what went on in the last year. Um, last year, this was a big part of your the department was, was created. It was kind of an outdated from a few places. Uh, it, was, it represented a significant increase in overall uh, budget. And so uh, I'm curious to know what, are, what happened over the last year? What, uh, what are some of the accomplishments that you've made as a department um, overall? I'm curious to understand uh, kind of what's the percentage breakdown uh, of T-PAL and the time that you're spending managing each of those departments. Um, uh, I heard you just talk about some, some things from you know, some people that like Tristan, I think, that will be responding to requests within schools. I'm now kind of wondering uh, where uh, the line between T-PAL and public buildings and W now exists um, and if there's overlap there. but. Um, let, let's start with, I guess, what are some of the achievements that have been made from TPAL? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, and I did prepare some information, unfortunately. Uh, we started the year with, uh, actually this past year, we've had about 3,000 work requests, uh, which we've, uh, we've plotted over for about 1,600 of those completed. We have about 1,400 open requests right now. Many of those are broken signs uh, and other issues of that sort, although not all of them. 
so we have a bit of a backlog. Uh, we worked through it pretty well, despite uh, some uh, resource shortages. We had uh, two or three folks out with an injury and some time and so forth. So we kind of plowed through that. Uh, very reactive, though, we got a lot of proactive work in the that We like to become more proactive uh, than we've been yet. So we've got to take care of our own backlog first before we start improving things elsewhere. So our goal really is to fix everything that's broken and respond as best we can. Sorry, what does that mean? Do we need to take care of our backyard before we? Well, I think the, the backlog in the, the backyard. backyard. Right, right. Before we grow back to the I mean, I, I talked a little bit about the school zone flashing lights. We know that just about every school needs some work you know, for these lights outside here. So we've been doing inventory that. We started to be proactive a little bit. Uh, once again, we could uh, just go out to now. Yesterday, what we did is we well, got some pricing from outside for probably twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars to hire someone to come in from outside to replace those lights. Uh, we didn't have the money to do that, and uh, under Brett Campbell's direction, we, we got pricing and equipment ourselves. We ordered the equipment, and we had our combined electricians out there the last couple of days doing that work themselves. So we're trying to move from being a little more reactive to a little more proactive, uh, but it's quite honestly a bit of a challenge. How's the backlog game? How is the backlog managed? Well, we actually just uh, are in the process of coming up with a new solution, new uh, uh, workload management system that allows us to track everyone who's coming in. That I can pull up all the reports assigned to you or one of our other people. We're out of those completed, which is pending. So that's not implemented now? Well, it's probably 75%. We've got some issues with it, but we've been tracking our workloads ever since February, or in February or March. And so that's, that's so how, is it, how is it maintained before? Uh, it was uh, pretty much what somebody said. We started in July, we uh, built a spreadsheet based on it. Wow. I think we built that spreadsheet up to 2200 <coughs> spreadsheet, which as you know becomes unmanageable very quickly. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the challenge there. Um, and so before you came in, it was in people's heads. <coughs> and yes. You built a spreadsheet. Yeah, last heads and various lists and pieces of papers and so forth. Wow. So where is the funding for this? System, where that come from? Your budget? Your uh, budget? My budget, yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the annual cost <coughs> uh, probably seven eight thousand dollars or nine thousand. So I mean, and who's managing that? I had him running my system. The implementation and the management? And the compliance and the update and everything else. So we're working with it, by the way. There's some things that I'm working on. So have you set any policies then, considering that you're just kind of getting up to speed with a considerable number of requests that have come in and backlog by 50%? Um, have you set any policy in terms of response times, either to requests that come through this body, through the mayor's office, or through uh, directly from constituents? Uh, well, I think we have an overarching policy, which is uh, uh, public safety first. So, you know, if we commit to you to, to fix four or five signs on your street, you know, we have a stop sign go down, we won't fix your street first, we'll go get that stop sign, it's more of a public safety issue. Uh, if we have a street light go up, we'll pull people from your street to work on that as well. Uh, so, I think public safety right now drives our priorities. Uh, you know, some other policy that we know we're moving forward with the, uh, the uh, conversion to LED. So, we're trying to slow down the replacement When's that started? Uh, we had the couple a few weeks ago. We probably uh, the next two or three weeks we'll start on some of the uh, replacing the multiple track. Right? And we just we just funded that whole thing. So yeah, and the contract I think was was just signed last week. was going to be signed this week. But we just funded that yes. three million dollar appropriation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then why here is there money uh, eight hundred twenty five thousand for street lighting? Well, that eight hundred twenty-five thousand, I think, section is more than that. But uh, that money uh, will go. That money, the expenditure, will go down once the saving system is fully implemented in the national grid billing is changed, and that will not hit probably until fiscal year nineteen. So the installation is starting soon, but when is when will the national when will they be recognized by national grid? It'll probably be, uh, we'll start working with National Grid within a month or two after uh, Amtrak's Canada, our power supplier, because they're part of that, that portion as well. Uh, 
Uh, we'll start working with them after the installation is completed. The installation probably will not be completed until late December or January. <coughs> there is some um, uh, mop up work that has to be done once the installation is complete. complete. Uh, a spreadsheet and an affidavit has to be sent from Siemens to National Grid. National Grid actually comes out and they do an audit. Uh, that audit can take some days, <coughs> probably takes more than a month to the schedule. Uh, and we get together with those guys and do a true up and what was converted and wasn't. Uh, and then they have to go back to their IT folks and uh, change all the bills. I think it's 220 or 230 bills, somewhere in that area that needs to be doesn't work as fast as we want. Uh, the good news is it'll go retroactive when it does happen. And uh, it should reflect a, uh, you know, a 60 65 reduction. So this money will be recouped from the state twenty part of sixty percent of the state twenty five. Uh, I'm, well, not, no, I'm, not, I'm not clear. Sixty percent of the eight twenty five will not be recouped uh, because the installation will not be complete until December. And uh, I do not believe the national grid will give us a credit going back to when the installation started. They don't do a weekend off so because these are all estimated bills they give us for the most part. So we're double paying. Them. No, no, no. We paid for the installation and the lights. We're not getting any value from that, and then we're paying for the lights. What's that? The old lights. Uh, I don't know where we got the thing. Well, I see. I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about this $825,000. I guess it might work out of what it's actually for. Well, you'll see the savings from the Siemens LED conversion program from the fiscally and It's a year long project. Uh...